Well, wouldn't you know, flowers are blooming and it is snowing outside at the time of recording. Yeah, it is spring. That is what we can expect. <laughs> oh, watching soccer games when it's this weather is, I have to tell you, if you are a soccer mom, man, it's brutal. That is why I so love watching basketball and coaching basketball. I love that. The squeak of the gym floor, the shoes. I love the swish of the net, that sound, and even the smells. No, not the BO. I like the smell of the gym. If you have ever spent any time as an athlete in a gym, you know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) But it is spring here. Last night, I went to a soccer game, watched my son play high school soccer, and burr, burr, burr. And they won. So that was fun. But we're not talking about that today. We are, however, talking about spring. A couple weeks ago, we went into how to bring spring into your home, ways that you can refresh and renew and revive, and things that you can do in order to to make it feel springy. But this is also the time where many of us start spring cleaning, or we have the idea of spring cleaning. So what do you think? Are you one of those spring cleaners? Do you love to have a Saturday with music blaring, windows open, birds chirping, and degreasing everything you can possibly degrease? Is that you? Maybe some of you, and I know I know one listener who loves to do this every week. <laughs> oh my goodness, if cleaning is a joy to you, bless you, bless you, bless you. It is not a joy to me, but it does need to be done. So here's the thing. If you have been hanging around me for a while, you know that the road to having a pretty home, a welcoming home, a lovely home, an inviting home, doesn't actually start with decorating. Do we remember this conversation? It doesn't. Spoiler alert, it actually starts way back in the spring cleaning. And not just the degreasing kind, but the decluttering kind. There are a few steps that we want you to take before you even make the pretty pretty. So that's what we're talking about in the next two episodes in this series, Spring Into Home. Enjoy today's show. We grew up with the phrase, home is where the heart is, but our culture has shifted and now the message is, home should be Pinterest perfect. I'm calling BS on that message. Home, it's not about the stuff, it's about the story. And whether you know it or not, your home is a reflection of you and is already saying something. So what is it that you want it to say? Hey, I'm Danny, a former first grade teacher turned home decorator. Going from a dual income to a single income so I could stay home with my babies meant budget, like ramen eating, Goodwill shopping budget, and I learned a few things along the way, like how to bring big style to your home without breaking the bank, and I'm sharing it all with you. Tips, tricks, decor, and design advice so you can learn to tell your story with your style, where you can start living free from the Pinterest perfect trap and start living a life of intention. Welcome to Fig and Farm at Home where we design happy living, and where it doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. The progression to decorating and to having a home that you love that is warm and welcoming and inviting and one that you feel ready to host on any given moment, the progression to that is actually starting way back with decluttering. Here's the progression. There's four steps. Decluttering, And you know, I like to call it edit. I think clutter can be a trigger word and it definitely is for me, but either way, it means the same thing. So you start with editing and then you go on to organizing. You probably do a little bit more editing because you realize that your organizing space is not sufficient. And then you're ready to do the cleaning, which leads to tidying and then decorating. Now, if you were counting, that is more than five (laughs) or four steps, which is what I promised it would be. But here's the thing. Editing is progressive. That is the first step. And then organizing. And sometimes during that organizing, you realize, oh, I don't have enough space. And that means you need to edit some more. We're going to talk about that a little later today too. And then you're ready for the cleaning part, the systematic cleaning, which some of you love, some of you hate, some of you hire out, some of you have your kids do it. (laughs) Some of you hope that your kids do it, but whoever does it, it's something that needs to be done. And then once you set up for cleaning, we have space for tidying. We have set that landscape for tidying, but that isn't one of the steps actually. And then we move on to decorating. To make the pretty pretty, to bring out your personality and your style, and to infuse all of that within your home's walls and floors and 
tchotchkes and all the things. But we need to set that landscape. So in this Spring into Home series, that's what we're talking about. And we're going to go back to the decluttering part. I don't really want to spend a lot of time about why. We probably all know why. We have too much stuff. Way back at the beginning of the podcast in episode four, we explored the question of, does your home serve you or are you serving your home? That's a good episode to go back to if you are wanting to incorporate a little bit of editing into your spring cleaning this spring. And then in episode 25, if you missed that one, that was a conversation I had with Jessica Hayes, host of Love Your People Well podcast and family therapist. And we talked a lot about how the impact too much stuff can have on already overtired, overworked, busy moms. And I know for me, having too much stuff and things out in my visual field, that can lead to overwhelm. And it can lead to overwhelm pretty quickly. And when I get overwhelmed, guess what? It has a negative impact on the people I care most deeply about. So we talk a lot about that. I encourage you to go back and listen to those two episodes if you need a little bit more convincing about taking care of the stuff that is taking over your home. Because the reality is, and here's the hard truth, and if you learn nothing else from this podcast, please learn this, that no matter how pretty we make our home, something is always going to feel off and out of place and misaligned and not quite right if we are always in constantly babbling the stuff that gets in our way. So let's battle the stuff. Let's get it out of our way so that we can focus on making that home feel lovely and warm and welcoming and inviting and everything that you want it to feel. So here we are this spring, boldly proclaiming that we are taking the first step in the progression towards decorating by editing. So how do we do it? You have heard time and time again, I am sure. Gather all your stuff out, make three piles, donate, throw away, give away, or maybe four and sell. Or maybe you've heard the popular theory of gathering everything out from your closet into the center of your room so that you can hold and manage and manipulate every single item one by one and decide if it brings you joy or not. And if it doesn't, get rid of it. Or maybe you've just scared yourself silly and by watching an episode or two or a season of Hoarders, and that is not what you aspire to. Whatever it is that you have watched or used as your ideas and approach to decluttering, I want you to think about these things. So here are my five tips for editing your home this spring. The first one is we want to be successful. And I know that sometimes when you bite off more than you can chew, it can feel daunting. It can feel opposite of successful. So how are we going to do that? We're going to start small. The first thing I want you to do is start small. And this small might be a room, but this small might be the junk drawer, quite literally. Or maybe it's the pantry, or maybe it is the freezer, or maybe it is the one shelf on your refrigerator. Maybe it's your makeup drawer. Wherever it is that you feel like you will have success in a short amount of time, start there. Just recently, I did my junk drawer. In fact, my junk drawer is so organized, you would not think that. (laughs) You would not think to call it a junk drawer, and I'm proud of that. It didn't take very long. It took maybe 10 minutes, and every time I open it, it feels nice. It feels organized. I know where the rubber bands are. I know where the pencils are. I know where the little scissors are. I know where all the little things are because I've made space for all the little things. Now, very opposite of that happens to be the room I am currently sitting in. It is my office space. And you have heard me talk about it. It feels like the bane of my decorating existence because it is a multi-use space that holds a lot of things and has become the junk room. It is awfully convenient for everyone in the family to dump things in here when they don't know where to put it. (laughs) This room is completely opposite of the little junk drawer. It is multifaceted. It holds, of course, all of the things to make my podcast happen. It holds all of our office supplies. It holds a lot of our um, memory paraphernalia, like photo boxes and things like scrapbooks and all of my arts and crafts, my sewing things. Not only that, but it holds some very emotional pieces. Not too long ago, I brought home several things, several boxes of some of the items that used to belong to my mom. 
And I still need to go through those. It's an emotional thing to go through that hard stuff. It doesn't mean that it should be avoided. It doesn't mean that the hard room or the big room or the overwhelming room should be avoided. It means start where you can feel successful. And I have done that in almost every room of my home. So I started with the junk drawer. I moved on to the pantry. Every once in a while, I do the refrigerator because that is consumable. There's lots of things that can be gone through. And then I moved on to closets and bathrooms because they were a little bit smaller. After that, I moved on to to spaces that were my spaces or common enough for the family to belong to. Bookshelves, credenzas, things like that. They're in the family space, but it's generally my stuff or our family stuff that I kind of keep track of. But I'm not, notice I'm not talking about going into the boys' room. I'm not talking about going into, um, other than their bathroom, I have not touched any of their things. This is their decision to make. But I have pretty much touched and, and edited everything in our home that is either mine or common use space. And now the final two pieces that I've saved for last are the garage, which wowzers, that's a big job, and my office space. And those are jobs I am currently, as I am recording, not literally as I'm recording, but you get it. This week, last week, it's a long process, so it is taking me longer than a couple hours. This is currently my mission, to make my space once and for all in my office functional and a space that serves me the best that it possibly can. So wherever you are doing your first editing, I encourage you to start extremely small. Start somewhere where you can see the results and you can feel the success straight away. Because what that's going to be is like a game of dominoes. One area leads into another, leads into another, leads into another. And as your areas become exponentially larger, and just grow in size just a teeny tiny bit, they'll also grow in complexity. Because it's just like the theory of when you move into a bigger space, you fill that bigger space. Yeah, just like that. That is the same theory. So the bigger the space, the more you generally have within that space. So start small. You can do it. And if you need to make a list of all of the rooms in your home and then break that list down into subcategories, little spaces within that room, do that. That might be helpful. And if you are a list girl, you're probably going to love the idea of checking off each box. I do, however, encourage you to leave um, spouses things alone and kiddo things alone because you know what? they need to learn how to do it too. That's a, that's a conversation for another time. But something that I think modeling them, the importance of editing your space and editing your stuff and organizing, modeling is the first step for them realizing how important it should be in their own space. The second thing to think about as you are editing your space, and especially as you start going from tiny space into bigger and bigger and bigger space, is to give yourself some parameters. Maybe the parameters are a time limit. I know if I'm going into the bathroom, I'm going to give myself one hour to edit that space. If I'm going into my master closet, I might need a little bit more time. I might need three hours. If I'm going into the garage, good night, I might need (laughs) a month. The parameters are really important in order to help keep you accountable. They can also help you get out of indecision and into action taking. So I know if my goal is to declutter my master bathroom, if I allowed myself five hours for that project, I might dawdle a little bit. I might try on makeup instead of actually get rid of the old stuff. But setting parameters will help you with decision making. Make sure that they're realistic, however. I know that my master bathroom is pretty big, And 30 minutes wouldn't necessarily be enough in order to help me feel successful. Just like the five-hour time limit might be too much and could cause distraction. I could get in my own way if that was the time frame. Another parameter that you might put in place when you're doing your editing is to have a goal for how many bags or boxes you want to get rid of. If you're decluttering your bookcase, have a goal for how many books you want to eliminate. In your master closet, have a goal. How many shirts do you want to get rid of? How many pairs of shoes? How many pants? You get the idea. The parameter is there. 
in order to help with decision making. So if you follow the approach that you have a bag for garbage, a bag for donation, a bag for selling, or if you follow the approach of I'm going to hold and touch every single thing before I make a decision, even following either of those strategies, having that parameter in place is going to help you be more efficient as you touch every single item or as you decide which items go into which bags. Now, this sounds really easy until we get to the hard stuff right? Until we get to making the decisions on things that you wonder if you should keep because maybe someday you might, that kind of thing. It has a little bit of attachment to your heart. Those decisions are the ones that are really hard. And this is where tip number three comes into play. When you begin wavering and you're not quite sure. When you find yourself in this situation, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Do you love it? Does it bring you joy? This is the part where I really think that question is valid, not necessarily in the beginning stages, but right here when it gets really hard. Do you love that piece? Do you love that barrette that you wore when you're six years old in that one picture? Do you love it? If you love it, you might be justified in keeping it a little longer. The other question to ask yourself is, have you used it in the last six months? And then be really honest with your answer. Not, well, but maybe, but I thought about it, but I'm not sure, but I think I will not that answer, a quick yes or no answer. When you're holding it, when you're touching it, have you used it in the last six months? Have you? Take closets, for example. I don't know about you, but for me, I don't have a capsule wardrobe, but I kind of wish I did because I kind of dress like I have a capsule wardrobe. All the time, I am gravitating towards the same things over and over and over again. And I neglect about 50% of my closet. I haven't worn some of those things in over six months. So that to me is an indicator that it's time to leave the home and bless someone else. The third question I want you to ask yourself is when you look at the piece, when you look at the item and you're holding it or you're thinking, what do I do? This is pretty tricky. Does the first thing that comes to mind start like this? Someday I will. Be really careful here because if you say someday I will, someday I will wear that. Someday I will use that scrapbook that I got in 1999 when scrapbooking was awesome. Someday I will, you get the idea. If it is someday I will, I want you to feel free. In fact, let's scratch that. I give you permission. I give you permission to bless it and release it because your someday I will will turn into box after pile, after box, after bag, after stuffed in the closet, and it will just keep accumulating with the other stuff that has the someday I will. Okay, I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but it is a true pill to swallow. So be real honest, be true to yourself, and allow yourself a little bit of grace if you actually do love that scrapbook in the corner. That's okay. If you love it, awesome. But be really honest when it comes to the ideas of someday I will, or I haven't used it for 15 years. Be really honest. Someone else will find so much value and joy in the piece that you're getting rid of. I did this just recently. You heard me say I am editing my garage, and part of that is creating zones for us to do the things in the garage that we want to do. And You know, you've heard me say that I have a brick and mortar store. And part of that is that I redo furniture. I find a piece that might be a little bit tired. It might be a little dated and I give it new life. And that happens different ways in different pieces. But I've had a couple pieces hanging out in the garage for about a year now. One about a year, one a little over a year. And they've just been taking up space. And as I've been editing, I have been very ruthless. Now, I'm not touching Greg's stuff. I'm just touching mine. And same thing. I'm not touching the boys. I'm just touching mine. And these were taking up space and valuable real estate. And I have a friend who does very similar work that I do, who is contemplating maybe someday, I hope sooner rather than later, opening up her own shop. And so as I'm saying goodbye to these, I know that these are going to bless her because it is inventory for her that she doesn't have to go and purchase. It is projects for her that she is able to work on, has the talent to work on, and will bless her in her new beginning. The fourth tip I have is going to come from questions from a lot of you. And I already anticipate the question you have, and that is, but aren't I wasting money by getting rid of it? I haven't used it, but I think I will. 
Aren't I wasting money? There's good news and there's bad news here. And I am putting on my big sister hat for all of you because I want you to hear me very clearly. When I say, when you get rid of the object is not the time when you have wasted your money. If you have wasted your money, it is when you purchased it in the first place. Let that sink in for a second. Getting rid of it isn't the time you're wasting your money. It's just not. You might have used it for one month. You might not have used it at all. You might have used it for 15 years. You might have used it for 10. Who knows? You have put a little bit of investment into it, but if you are no longer using it, if it is not something that you love, if it is collecting dust in the corner, if it is holding that sign that loudly proclaims, someday I will, let it go and let someone else be blessed by it. You already spent the money on it. You're not respending the money by giving it away. You've already spent the money on it. So let it go. Bossy big sister hat off now. (laughs) All right, tip number five. And I did say I only have five, but I actually thought of two more. So these are going to be bonus. Yay. And no more bossy big sister, I promise. But tip number five is when you have your piles created and your timeline set, you've set those parameters and you've reached them take action. Do not store them in your garage for the garage sale. Do not store them in the garage for the Facebook marketplace post. Do not store them on your front porch (laughs) waiting for the HOA to give nasty letters at you for cluttering up your front porch. Do not do that. Load them into your car and donate them. Load them into your car and take it to the dump. Load it into your car and take it to the friend who you know needs the baby stuff. Load it and take it. Take it then. The sooner it's out of your house, the more confident you will be in keeping your decision made. And not only that, but it eliminates the idea that you can go into the garage and you can decide, you know what, maybe someday I will, maybe I do love it. It eliminates that completely. This is especially helpful if you have little kiddos who tend to be pack rats and they have agreed to or helped you go through their things and they've made their own piles. If you keep that stuff around, (laughs) they are going to find it like a bloodhound. (laughs) Trust me, they will. So get it out. Get it out. (laughs) The sixth tip I have is to do it often. Yeah. One and done is not the name of the game here because we are constantly bringing things into our home. But if I know that I'm spending so much time editing my master closet, I know I don't want it to be in that same shape next time. So in that case, I'm going to be setting up a system that allows me to keep my space in my closet a little bit clutter free. Here's what I do. Every time I purchase a shirt, I get rid of two. Did you hear that? Yes. Not one, two. Every time I get a pair of pants, I get rid of two. Every time I get a pair of shoes, you get it. I get rid of two. I get rid of double so that I'm making space as I go, so that I'm not getting into the same position I was when I did the deep edit last time. That same strategy doesn't necessarily apply to every situation, but if you edit often, if you put those rooms and those spaces on a rotating schedule, you would allow continual editing to happen without it being such a cumbersome job. So for example, if I took my master calendar and I decided I was going to have two rooms every month. Well, that's, that's 24 rooms. <laughs> Do we have 24 rooms in our house? No, I don't. Do you? Okay. 24 spaces, we could say. Maybe you do 24 spaces and you do two things a month. That's manageable, right? I know that maybe every May I put my, my downstairs bathroom and my dining room on the list. Those are two things that I could do that month in order to keep edited, to keep free from the clutter that inevitably piles up. Now, one suggestion as you are, if you are going to do the rotating schedule is to choose two things that are opposite in weight. What do I mean by that? I mean, do opposite of what I am doing currently. (laughs) Right now, I am leaving the two heaviest, most cumbersome, hardest rooms in the house to edit at the same time don't do that. <laughs> that is that is crazy town and crazy making. So what I would suggest doing is choose something that will take you not a whole lot of time and choose something that will take a little bit more time. So if I were to put my office on a rotating schedule every April, we'll say, 
I would pair that with the junk drawer because I know that little thing can take me 10 minutes where my office might take me and probably will next year, days, maybe even a couple weeks. It is going to take longer. So pair it with something that is not going to drive you crazy town when you're working on it. And again, that just rolls back into setting yourself up for success, which is tip number one. So anything you can do to set yourself up for success is going to be helpful. And my last tip is to give yourself a carrot. Yes, give yourself a reward. You've just done hard work. You're making habits where habits were not before. What can you reward yourself with that would be meaningful? That would allow you the motivation to keep going when it does get tough. When you do have to ask yourself those silly questions of, do I love it? Will I use it someday? How long was it ago did I use it? All of those questions. Give yourself a carrot so that you can get through it. But I would suggest that your carrot isn't something that you're going to be bringing into your home. I would suggest that. Maybe it's something that you don't normally spend money on for yourself. Maybe it's a day at the spa. Maybe it's a manicure. Maybe it is a night out at a play or going to your favorite museum. Maybe it's trying that fancy restaurant that you've been wanting to try for a while. Think something that is more experience than stuff related. Because remember, we're trying to break habits and we don't want to reward ourselves with something that could lead to the same position that we were in originally. And very last tip, I promise it just came to mind, but I think it's a great one. And that last tip is to find a buddy to do it with. Have an accountability partner. Maybe your accountability partner and you will come up with the same goal so you can go to that play together or you can try out that fancy restaurant together. But having someone that you can check in with, that you can communicate your timeline with, you can tell them what your parameters are, that you can say, gosh, this is where I'm getting stuck. Having someone to bounce those ideas off of could be really very helpful. Now, I know I can't go to that play with you, but I can be your accountability partner. So I'm inviting any of you who would like to edit one room of your home to come and post it in the Facebook group. Come share your before picture, the parameters you want to place. Do you want to put a timeline or do you want to put a goal for the number of bags you want to fill? And what is your carrot hanging over the end? Come post that. Let me encourage you along the way, along the journey, and let's support each other. That's what the community is for. You can find that at bit.ly forward slash design 101 group. In our next episode, we're continuing the spring into home series, and we're going to be talking about organizing. My plan was to talk about it today, but man, I got long winded and ideas kept popping. So I was running with it. But next time we will talk about organizing tips for doing that efficiently, creating space. Now that you've edited how you can organize well. All right. Until next time, I will see you soon. Hey, real quick before you go, if you learned something new or found value in today's podcast, would you head over to iTunes to Fig and Farm at Home and leave a review and subscribe to the show? That would be awesome. And if you'd like to connect with my community of mamas who are learning to be intentional storytellers within their own homes, join us at bit.ly forward slash design 101 group. There's always more room at the table. See you soon.